People around the world look up and see our sun every day. But through a space telescope, it looks nothing like it does from down on the ground. The surface dances with arches of solar material that reach up into the solar atmosphere, an environment of charged particles and magnetic fields unlike anything we experience on Earth. In 2018, the Parker Solar Probe will launch from a Delta IV heavy rocket and travel approximately three months to take its first swing by the sun right through that atmosphere. Over seven years, it will get ever closer until ultimately it's within 3.9 million miles or 6.2 million kilometers of the sun's surface. That's so close that the previous record holder, the Helios B spacecraft, was seven times farther away. An important objective of the Parker Solar Probe is to learn more about the solar wind, an exotic stew of magnetic forces, plasma, and particles. It interacts with planetary magnetospheres and atmospheres, which over the eons may have contributed to a planet's habitability. It blankets our spacecraft and astronauts traveling to the moon and Mars. It affects space weather at and around Earth and causes beautiful aurorae. The solar wind also travels at immense speeds, and scientists want to learn why. It leaves the sun at a speed of up to 500 miles or 800 kilometers per second and engulfs all major planets in the solar system. What is the source of the wind? From a distance, it's difficult to tell. Dr. Adam Zabo, the Parker mission scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, says, We've been examining the solar wind for over 50 years, but the wind is processed by the time it reaches Earth. By studying it much closer to the sun, the Parker probe will be able to tell us such things as what part of the sun is providing the energy source for the wind's particles and how they can accelerate to such incredibly high speeds. It's like trying to understand how a car runs without looking at the motor. It's important to get under the hood to determine the mechanisms driving the actual system. The Parker Solar Probe is the only NASA mission named after a living person. Dr. Eugene Parker, an astrophysicist, is credited with developing the theory behind the solar wind in the late 1950s. When asked why he thinks so many people are drawn to this particular mission, Dr. Parker said, I assume it's the same reason that I got excited about it. This is a journey into Never Never Land, you might say, where it's too hot for any sensible spacecraft to function. But some very clever engineering and construction has succeeded in making what looks like a very workable mission. Clever indeed. At its fastest speed, the Parker Solar Probe will orbit the sun at 430,000 miles per hour or 716,000 kilometers per hour. That's fast enough to get from New York City to Tokyo in under a minute. It will absorb temperatures as high as 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit or 1,400 degrees Celsius. And soon, it will begin to transmit the data to help us better comprehend one of the least understood phenomena in our solar system, the solar wind. Sweep investigation consists of three separate instruments and a central electronics box. Most of the instruments within Sweep sit on either side of the spacecraft, stare out over the entire sky, and make maps of all the different particles and what energies they're moving at, uh, and what, what types of particles they are. The purpose of Sweep is to measure the bulk of the solar wind and the solar atmosphere. One of the biggest questions we want to resolve with Solar Probe is how the corona and the solar wind are heated. In order to do that, we need to see if there are waves that are coming from the sun and depositing energy within the solar atmosphere and in the solar wind. So we have a series of sensors across the spacecraft that will collect individual particles, electrons, fully ionized hydrogen and helium, which we call protons and alphas, uh, and other minor ions. Uh, and make maps of the number of particles as a function of their speed and energy and, and, and type. We take those maps on the ground and we can interpret them to figure out the temperature, the density, the pressure of the solar wind uh, and, and the solar atmosphere. On the ram side of the spacecraft, so that's in the shadow of the heat shield, in the direction that Solar Probe is moving around the sun, we have Span A. Span A looks ahead of the spacecraft. It has an electron and an ion instrument and they can see the entire sky on that side of the spacecraft. On the other side, the anti-ram side of the spacecraft, we have span B, which basically looks behind our direction of motion. 
Span A and Span B are each able to take an inventory of electrons coming from any direction in the sky. And their fields of view stitched together like the seams on a baseball. The spans combine to give us a field of view that covers nearly the entire sky. But we have one large gap in our field of view and it's produced by the heat shield at the front of the spacecraft. So we have the solar probe cup as the final instrument within SWEEP. The solar probe cup sits on a strut. It looks around the heat shield and faces directly into the sun. When our solar wind or solar atmosphere comes blowing into the cup, if those particles which are charged don't have enough energy, they get reflected out by that electric field we've set up. The particles with enough energy to make it past the electric field come in and strike a plate and we record the current. All we have to do in an individual measurement is sweep in voltage and measure the number of particles that can make it in as a function of voltage. That sweep, when we interpret it, lets us figure out the average speed, direction, energy, temperature, density of individual populations of particles. Whisper instrument is made of two telescopes that are designed to sit between the two antennae from the field experiment and image the solar wind and the corona as we're flying into it. So Whisper is the lightest instrument we've built before, but had really two requirements. We wanted to be able to see far from the spacecraft and then be able to track this, the structures that are flowing out from the sun and then as they pass the spacecraft, we would see them locally at the spacecraft. The WHISPER instrument is the only imaging instrument on the Parker Solar Probe, and it is looking in the direction that the spacecraft is traveling. And what it sees is light scattered by the dust that's in orbit about the sun. But then, once we remove that, what we see is the light scattered by the electrons in the corona, in the solar wind. These measurements that we're making uh, from the WHISPER instrument have been made before by other instruments from 1AU, from the distance of the Earth, about 100 million miles from the Sun. By getting closer, we're increasing then the ability to see what's really close to the Sun. The fact that you're close means that you, you don't have all this, this material that's in between you and the, and the object that you're really interested in. And that contributes to, to background noise. And so you're looking at something that's much more pristine. You're looking at just that object all by itself. By going eventually 95% of the way to the sun, we are going to be able to see what is a dust-free region around the sun. That's going to be exciting. Parker Solar Probe cannot have any imager that looks at the sun directly. So the WHISPER instrument looks off of the heat shield that protects us from this very intense heat. And so we, we sort of peek over the edge of it. We use it as a shield to block out the sun itself. And that allows us to see this very faint glow coming from the corona that's only observed during an eclipse, for example. We're creating an artificial eclipse. Well, eclipses are great, but from the data point of view, I like my instruments better. They're working continuously, round the clock, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, sometimes for years. Fields is in a special place on the spacecraft. The electronics package is inside the spacecraft where most of the electronics are, but all of our sensors are mounted on the outside of the spacecraft. We have three sensors that measure magnetic fields that are mounted on a boom behind the spacecraft in the shadow shield, and then we have five sensors that measure plasma voltage. These are electric field sensors. They extend into full sunlight, uh, and they get very hot. Two of the key measurements to understanding coronal heating are the measurement of the magnetic field and the electric field, and together they give us what's called the pointing flux, which is the energy flux of the of the corona. And to make those measurements, we have to actually go into that plasma and, and put sensors in the plasma to measure magnetic fields and electric fields directly, and that's what, that's what fields will do. Solar wind is the escaping atmosphere of the sun. It's the escaping corona uh, of the sun. The corona is heated in a way that we don't understand yet, uh, presumably involving magnetic fields uh, by energy that's, that comes from below in the photosphere and it's heated to such a high temperature that it can escape the gravitational potential of the sun and become an escaping wind, a stellar wind, a solar wind. Well, the design of the fields instrument is a new thing for solar wind physics. Um, it kind of combines two previous styles of, of experimentation. There are two ways to measure electric fields in space. One is using a, a technique that's called a double probe. Then there's another technique which is measuring plasma waves or radio waves. And fields for the first time brings these two techniques together. 
I think the very first data that we get will be revolutionary. At first blush, it'll just be a bunch of numbers as a function of time. Um, but the team, the science team, will take those numbers and make uh, and make visualizations in the form of spectrograms. And eventually, those uh, those data will be related to models, and so we'll be able to compare directly 3D visual models of the coronal magnetic field. These measurements have never been made in the environment close to the sun. We've made measurements similar to this in the Earth's magnetosphere, uh, Earth's ionosphere, but putting a package like this into into the solar corona has just never been done. The closest anyone's ever been to the sun, uh, and Based on what we've seen so far from spacecraft not quite as close, uh, it's going to be striking and I think revolutionary. ESIS, the Integrated Science Investigation of the Sun, is an experiment which looks at energetic particles over a broad range of energies, from tens of thousands of electron volts up to about 100 million electron volts. The ESIS instrument is based on solid-state detectors. Those are detectors that, when a particle passes through them, energy is deposited, and you can measure that energy, and you can measure that the particle has actually passed through. So there's the solar wind, which is this continuous flow of lower energy particles. And then there are much more sporadic and episodic events, like solar flares, that spew out great numbers of these much more energetic particles. In our higher energy instrument, we have a whole set of layers of these detectors, and when a particle passes through those layers, it leaves energy in each, every, each and every one of those detectors. Those detectors are also segmented in pieces like a pie, and so when a particle comes through from a particular direction, you can tell both the direction the particle came through at, and you can tell the energy and species of that particle by looking at all the different uh, energy depositions. In our lower energy instrument, we also have the same sort of solid state detectors, but in addition to that, we use an extra trick, which is when a particle passes through a very thin foil, it ejects an electron, we're able to detect that, and that gives us the start timing for the particles. One of the big issues for ESIS is to understand the difference between solar energetic particles that just come from the sun with a certain energy and those that are energized in interplanetary space as they move outward. By the time they get out to the Earth's orbit, um, that's all so messed up, mangled up, that it's kind of hard to tell the difference between those. But as we get in closer and closer to the sun, we'll be able to differentiate those two types of sources, which will be really important for understanding the fundamentals of energetic particles in the solar system. By going in close and measuring the detailed distributions of these energetic particles, their energies, directions, and their species, we're going to learn things that we couldn't possibly learn by looking forever from a remote distance. And by understanding our sun in detail, we can understand lots of other stars in much greater detail.